Hey everyone. Um, so a little bit of context. This is a talk that I gave at CartageCon in 2017 in Los Angeles on the third day. And I thought that people would be recording the whole thing. That didn't happen, turns out. Um, and so here I am, now that I'm back in school, I have a bunch of equipment which I can leech off of, including this television, this sweet microphone, and also the tripod that you're kind of standing on, I guess. Um, and so without further ado, let's get into the talk. Um, and the talk is a proposed model for how people come up with flourishes. And I'm going to mostly be talking about cuts because that's the area that I know most. Um, but I think this applies to other things as well. And it's an engineer's approach because I am an engineer, at least an engineer, at least in training. And uh, I very much like to think I think like one. And so therefore, there's some computer science examples in there, and a lot of stuff that might sound very fancy and complicated. It's really not that complicated, so stick with me, and let's get into it. And we'll start with a line, and this line is meant to represent a flourish. And it represents the flourish in the sense that it's kind of like the timeline to a video of the flourish, right? So it starts with an opener and ends with a closer. Um, and in the middle you have individual beats, and those are kind of hard to define. One way to think about it is that a cut is kind of a sequence of grips that are uh, with transitions between them, so you're transitioning from grip to grip, and these dots kind of represent those grips. It's not super well defined, it's kind of wonky, but it's the kind of thing where when you see it, you know it is there. And so some people like to call them beats, some people like to call those moments, uh, mechanics or phrases, it doesn't really matter, um, but uh, the idea is there. And the question is, how do you do this? How do you come up with one of these? Well, um, the thing that I usually start with is one chunk. And this chunk I like to call a nugget. Um, and it's kind of like nugget as in a nugget of gold, right? It's a, it's a very small thing. Um, and the kind of thing that you come up with after a three hour session on your bed on a Sunday afternoon kind of thing. And uh, your goal is to take that nugget and expand it until you hit an opener and a closer. And to do that, usually you fiddle with the thing and eventually you find another grip that you can go into, which is a way to move forward. Now, hypothetically, you can imagine that there's actually a couple things you could do, right? Because you have a bunch of fingers and they can move in a bunch of ways and therefore it's not unreasonable to think that there's a couple options. And one way to think about this is that if you were to first find this in an alternate universe, uh, an alternate version of you would find this route instead. Um, once you have that, then you can go another level, right? And sometimes you'll have a lot of different options, things you could look at. Um, sometimes you'll be really restricted because you all your fingers are locked and you really can't do anything at all. Um, but you can repeat the process until sometimes you hit a potential closer. And a closer is something where all the cards end up in like a neat packet, sometimes in dealer's grip, but also really in anything that you want. Sometimes you'll end up with a dead end and uh, your fingers are really locked together and you really can't do anything, you can't find anything to do, um, which is always a bummer. And I have these areas here to represent that you could really go on for a long time if you don't try to find a closer, right? Now the thing is that the nugget is not necessarily an opener. Um, and as a result, you need to find an opener and the process of finding an opener is basically like this, but in the other direction. And when you think about this hypothetical tree, your goal is to find the best flourish in that tree. And a flourish is really just one path in that tree that starts with an opener and to end with a closer. The thing is that that's one option, right? That's one possible path you could take, but so is this, right? And how do you know that this one is not better than the previous one or, or the next one, right? So that's a tough problem. And to answer it, I'm going to turn to IBM and specifically their supercomputer called Deep Blue, which they built in the 1990s. Deep Blue is a computer that was built exclusively uh, for playing chess. Everything about it, both software and hardware, they even designed microchips that are optimized to calculate uh, chess plays. Um, and in 1996, uh, they challenged Gary Kasparov. Um, I think it's 1996. Uh, I look forward to being wrong about this. Uh, Challenge Gary Kasparov, who at the time was the chess grandmaster. Um, 
And as history remembers it, uh, IBM lost. Uh, but uh, they worked on it a little bit, and the following year they challenged Gary, and he lost this time. And this was a huge deal in the AI community because um, chess was always considered to be one of those unbeatable games by computers, just because there's way too much to think about. So what did IBM do? Um, well, they use an algorithm called Minimax. And it works a little bit like this. Uh, you start with a board uh, with a bunch of pieces on it, and you're in the middle of the game, for example. I know what you're thinking. Nothing to do with what I'm talking about. By the way, this works a lot better when there's a bunch of, there's like an audience and a bunch of people, they laugh. Uh, I'm alone here, so the joke doesn't really quite work as well. So you have a board, right? Uh, and from that board, you look at every piece that could move and try to move it. Um, and that leads you to a bunch of new boards. And this is basically simulating the next step in the game. Um, now, here I only have three boards, but on average, in a game of chess, you can do approximately 30 uh, different moves. So one thing about this is that every one of these boards is actually 10 boards. There's a lot of boards. Uh, especially when you consider that after that, you're going to do that same process again for every single one of these boards where you have 30 new options per board. And again, this is per board, so while there's 30 up here, there's 900 down here. 900 is like, is pretty manageable for a computer, but Deep Blue on average did something like 6 or 7 steps, um, and so that's 30 to the power of 6 or 7, which is a lot. Um, and that's the limit to how, how far into the future you can look. Um, for the particular diagram, we're just going to look two moves into the future. Um, and the goal of the computer is to get the best situation at the end. Hopefully they win, right? Uh, how can it do that? Well, first of all, you need to figure out what is a good position to be in. And to do that, it uses an evaluating function. And evaluating function is uh, a function that looks at the board and determines, uh, based off of the number of pieces that have been discarded, uh, the types of pieces that are on the board, how close they are to eating another piece, uh, and, and things like that, um, look at all these parameters, kind of weighs them, and pops out a number, like 62. That's pretty cool, um, but 62 is kind of useless until you have a uh, thing to relate it to, and the function is built such that a 100 is, uh, means that the computer wins. Whereas a zero means that the computer loses and therefore the opponent wins. Um, which means that if you have another board, which is a 72, a uh, 79, um, you're a lot more interested in that over the previous one. And if you have a board that's 41, you kind of want to avoid that. That's not great. So the computer looks at every single one of the boards at the bottom. Um, again, two layers in, it's about 900 and evaluates it for everything. Now, what it's trying to do is find a path through that tree to get to the highest possible score. You might think, okay, so why don't you just do the path that ends at 94? Because 94 is a pretty close to 100, so it's got to be good. Well, the problem is that while you're trying to maximize your score, uh, the opponent is trying to minimize your score. Because remember that when the score is low, it's effectively high for the other player, right? And so minimizing the computer score is means that the player is closer to winning. So therefore, while you're trying to maximize at this level, the opponent is trying to minimize at this level, and the computer is trying to maximize at that level. So to do that, um, you're going to look at every one of the boards at the second to last level and say, OK, so I'm trying to make, maximize here, so I'm going to deletes these two things because I don't care about these options relative to this one. And do that for every board here, which basically bumps a bunch of uh, scores up a notch. Cool. Uh, now, you have to take into account that the other player is going to do the same thing, but they're going to try to minimize their score. So you have three things here, and they want the lowest score here, which in this case is 79. Which means that the most likely thing to happen, if both players kind of play optimally, is for this path to be chosen. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is that uh, the final optimal path 
was 79 and not 94, despite 94 being the highest score. And that's because you have this trade-off between the computer maximizing and the opposing opponent minimizing. Now let's take a second and think about what I'm trying to say here, because sure, if you tilt your head, there's a tree here, and I was talking about trees before, so you know, there's gotta be a connection, and there is. Um, but if you were to take this a little too literally, you might think that I'm suggesting you look at every possible flourish in that tree I was talking about earlier, look at the closers, and then reverse engineer the things, and then kind of find the thing like that. That's not what I'm getting. Um, there's actually just two ideas I'm interested in. First of all, the idea of an evaluating function. It's really kind of interesting because we don't think about art as being evaluated. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, and it applies to flourishes too, but if you think about it, you can look at a flourish and say, huh, that's kind of cool, I really like that. And then you can look at another flourish and say, huh, that's garbage, I don't want to ever see that again. So in your head, there's got to be something going on that evaluates them relatively. And although you might not be able to put a number on it, there is definitely that function. Now, we don't really know how the brain works. Um, definitely not enough to perfectly comprehend how it does things. But we know there's a lot of parameters that go into that function, right? So we have things like flow. Uh, if you have two flourishes that are pretty much the same, but one flows a lot better than the other, you're going to perform the one that flows. Um, originality is something that we care about a lot in our community, and therefore a flourish that, are, that is more original is going to be more popular. Um, you also might be able to deck points for pet peeves. I have a lot. Uh, other people have different pet peeves. Uh, which leads to the idea that while some people are trying to optimize for comfiness, other people might be trying to optimize for difficulty. Uh, and so this is why different people have different tastes and like different flourishes, is because they have different evaluating functions. Um, and granted they can be slightly different, in the end, the general community has a general idea of what a good flourish is and what a bad flourish is. But um, this function takes other things into account. Uh, things like themes is something that I care about a lot, having a theme throughout a flourish. Um, other people care a lot about whether you can combo or not uh, into other things. So something that ends in deal script, for example, will nicely combo into other things. Um, this is kind of a funky one. Uh, this is really just to tickle my love of math. But the idea here is that when you have all these different beats, um, if a flourish has a bunch of really boring beats, uh, then it's going to be a lot less interesting than a flourish with a bunch of interesting beats. Uh, and usually good flourishes have at least like one really interesting moment, and so I'm trying to capture that with the idea that you look at each beat and you evaluate it with a slightly different evaluating function and do the sum of all of that, and that's, that's something that matters in the overall flourish. Um, now, another one which is interesting uh, is the idea uh, that X packets equals x piece, which is attributed to Case Duncan. Uh, you can more, learn more about it in my stream with him uh, from somewhere on my YouTube channel, I'm sure you can find it. Uh, the idea is that if, if you have a three packet cut, it should have about three beats. If you have four packet cuts, it should have about four beats. And Chase came up with it um, because he saw this rule being followed by a lot of floors that he liked, and so he decided to do the same thing. Um, there's a couple reasons why you might think that's true uh, overall. It's more of a guideline than a rule, but what I like about it is it's very precise, right? You can look at a flourish and say, yes, that follows that rule. Look at another one and says, no, it just doesn't. Um, and that's something that matters. It could be caught with some of the other things, because um, it's not a, none of these things are deal breakers, um, but it's certainly a rule that is, uh, that is part of it. Um, and I'm sure there's much more. Um, I think an interesting exercise for people to do is think about what things they like in their flourishes, uh, and think about what they like in flourishes that they see. Uh, I think that's an important part of becoming better cards. So, how does this apply to our big old tree? Because the thing is that there's a lot of options here. There's a lot of things to do. So, remember, we're trying to find the best path in here. And what I was talking about before with IBM had to do with looking at every single possibility and choosing the best one. And that works mathematically. The thing is that it's not feasible. Uh, the computer can't do more than six or seven steps because it just doesn't have enough memory. Um, we don't have the time to go through every single option. Be able to do them well enough 
that we can actually evaluate them properly, right? Because things are technically difficult in cardistry. Um, and so that's, that's interesting because actually um, I kind of lied about IGF. They didn't exactly do what I was talking about. What I was talking about was the default implementation of Minimax. They did a lot of very fancy stuff to optimize it a lot, which was necessary because, as I said, they could, you, the, <clears throat> the algorithm works best when you're uh, looking as far into the future as possible. And as a result, instead of evaluating everything, every time they go through a level, you're going to evaluate every single board there and say, huh, maybe this board is just not worth it. Maybe I can kind of tell without really looking into it that this is the kind of board that is just going to lead me to blues, and so I'm just not going to care about it. Um, which means that now you only have uh, you only have six boards at the bottom, which is nice. Not only because you have less memory to take, but that means you have more memory to use to look at some of these boards. So if you have one that's particularly interesting, you can look at more options down there, which is really nice. Um, now, one thing that's important to keep in mind here is that this is no longer mathematically um, perfect. Uh, you, this no longer, no longer proves that, proves that whatever option you're going for is going to be uh, necessarily the best because you're making an assumption about what's down here without actually calculating it. And this is the thing that we do in Cartesy all the time, uh, and I'll get back to exactly how. So this brings me to the actual model that I'm proposing, which is you start with a nugget, and you're you know, gonna start with sticking with it. You're gonna say that's gonna be part of the flourish. And then you look at a bunch of different options, and you say, okay, I'm not interested in necessarily just the most interesting beats, but I'm looking at the most promising one. And I'm not, gonna I'm not gonna look into every single one of them. I'm gonna choose one and look at a bunch of other options. And then you do the same thing over again until you hit a closer. Then you do the thing in the other direction, which is, okay, so I have a particular grip here. Um, it's kind of hard to go in reverse in cardistry. So usually what I find myself doing is I find a bunch of grips and find transitions into the nugget. Um, and that's kind of how I reverse engineer things. Obviously, there's more to it than that, but for the sake of the model, we'll leave it at that. And then you do the same thing. You find the one that's the most promising and lead back until you have an open. So there you go. But let's not let's not click away just yet. Uh, first, let's think about what can we learn from this model, right? Because the point of the model is not really just to do it for shiggles. We are interested in what's uh, what we can get out of it. Get out of it. And there's four things that I've uh, found. First of all, don't settle with the first thing that you find. Because imagine if you went with this thing, then you wouldn't have ended up with this cut, which although it's not uh, mathematically proven to be the best cut, it's the most likely one. Because at any point in time, you chose what was the most promising. Um, and more importantly, the chances are that the first thing that you find at any point in time is not going to be the best thing. Um, don't throw anything away. So every once in a while, you'll find a really cool opener. It's really cool, but it doesn't quite fit, right? You need to do like a really weird regrip to get into the rest, or it just thematically doesn't make any sense. So while well, you have your flourish here, and you can work on it and kind of improve it and uh, put up on Instagram or whatever, you're gonna look at that opener and say, huh, that's my new nugget. I'm gonna use that as a nugget and create a new flourish. Um, and this doesn't just work for individual beats or just openers and things like that. You can also use that for entire chunks. Uh, and I've definitely done that. Um, Flourish is mine, and you probably you might not know them. Uh, things like uh, Cartesian and Soutmouton are two flourishes, uh, and I'll try to get links here, uh, are two flourishes that used to be the same. Um, but I acknowledge that they're two very different themes, and they didn't really work together, so I split them off. And, um, basically came up with a different opener for Soutmouton, which used to be the opener for Cartesian, uh, which looked something like this, like just kind of... Uh, and then Cartesian, I just found an opener for it, and then there you go. The process also isn't always linear. It'd be nice if the first thing, if the thing that you think to be the most promising is always the best thing, but sometimes you'll just hit a dead end. When you hit a dead end, 
Um, you can try really hard to find something, anything, but often it's good to look back. And there's a couple things you can do. You can look at uh, other options that you might have dismissed earlier um, because you were really excited about that, even though it doesn't lead to anything. Um, or you can go, go back to the decision as to what you thought was the most promising and acknowledge that you might have been wrong. And so therefore you can look at something else and then do the whole, whole process again and then find a closer. So um, the final thing is what do good cardists do? According to this model, what is it that good cardists do so that they create better flourishes than less good cardists or less experienced cardists rather? Well, for one, they have a good evaluating function, right? They have something that kind of aligns with the community and is um, a function that will tell them that the flourish that they're working on is actually good, not just for them, but also for other people. Um, and they also have a good idea of how to evaluate. They have a good idea of what things they're looking for in their flourishes and what things they're optimizing for. Um, they are able to see potential in certain options. Um, so, uh, certain things in which, uh, which might seem not to lead anywhere for some people might look like they have a lot of potential for a better cardist. Uh, someone who has more experience, who has created more, therefore kind of sees those patterns. Um, good cardists are also able to come up with innovative options. They know what's been on the market for a while uh, and they are able to uh, kind of think outside the box and look at, search for motions that are, sorry, uh, less interesting and uh, therefore find more innovative options which means uh, more original cuts etc which is again something we value in the community also they can just do more things they've been doing cardistry for longer and therefore have more technical ability and uh, when you have more technical abilities that means that your branches have more uh, branch off in more directions which means you have more options which means you have uh, more likely uh, better things you can do. So I've been talking about cut this whole time, um, but if you look at this diagram, you can change some of the words in here and have it still be true. Like for example, if you're talking about an ISO routine, an ISO routine is a bunch of different components and you do a bunch of different things, different things one after the other. To get the best ISO routine, you want to consider a bunch of different possible moves and find the one that works best with the flow. And here you have a completely different evaluating function. And again, I don't really know what I'm talking about in terms of ISOs, but what I can tell is it has the same structure. So it's something that goes on at a time with a bunch of chunks, and therefore the same process might as well apply. Um, same with creating combos, right? If you, instead of looking at uh, those beats as um, beats of a cut, those can just be flourishes. And therefore you can find a really cool combo, which isn't just the first thing that works, Right, so just something that works at all, it being an interesting combo. We can also have combos that actually make sense, and combos that uh, are more interesting to watch than just a sequence of cuts. Um, and with that, that's the end of my talk. That's all I have to say, um, at least for now. Uh, I acknowledge that there's a lot of stuff that's missing for the entire creative process. This is actually just one chunk of it. Um, I don't actually mention how to find a good nugget uh, and what to do with it and, and things like that. Mainly because I haven't really quite figured out how to put that into words. Um, but this is an experiment. I would like to see if uh, you agree with this, if you disagree with this, um, if this is something that you find yourself doing, if you uh, really have a completely different process, I'd love to hear how that, uh, how that differs. If you, you know, violently disagree, I'd hear, like to hear why. If you violently agree, you know, I'll take that too. Um, and yeah, uh, feel free to uh, talk about this in the comments of this video and I'll have this thing on Reddit too and I post on Instagram and uh, you can always message me on uh, Instagram as well with DMs because um, I'm always happy to talk about these things. And yeah, hopefully you uh, enjoyed this and uh, we'll see you whenever I see you again.